Today I wanted to show you this mini console that I made almost a year ago. I call it the Megaplex because it uses quite a substantial LED matrix as a display. The interesting thing about it is that the display is only driven by this Tencent RISC microcontroller here. It has no active components outside of that. Not even current limiting resistors. The display consists of 240 LEDs. On top of that, we even have sound and buttons to control it. And there is implementation of soft USB to program it. But let's power it up and see what it does. Yes, that's bad Apple. The screen is quite bright, so I will turn down the camera a little bit. Although the microcontroller can only store 16 kilobytes of data and code, I was able to fit 3000 frames of bad Apple, including the music. I wrote a special compression method for that, but that's a topic for another time. The topic I want to focus on today is the Charlieplexing. I'm able to drive these 240 LEDs with 16 pins and no external components. So how does that work? Let's take a closer look how Charlieplexing works. So this is an LED. If we connect high to the left side and low to the right side, it will light up. Since it's still a diode, if we connect high to the right side and low to the left side, the current is blocked and it doesn't light up. If we connect high on both ends, the voltage difference is zero, so it doesn't light up. It's the same with low on both sides. Since we want to control the LED, we connect the right side to low, which is ground in our case, and, and the left side to a pin that we can control from the code. If the pin is set to output and we assign a high, current is flowing again and the LED lights up. On the other hand, if we assign low, it turns off. And that's basically our blink program. Let's extend this thought and attach a second pin to the right side. Now we can check all the states on both sides. Low and low stays off. High and low lights up. High and high is again zero volts potential, so it doesn't light up. And low and high is blocked again. We didn't win anything from attaching the second pin. But if we connect an LED directed to the other side, assigning low and high will actually light that one up. But that doesn't give us any advantage so far. However, we used our pins only as output pins yet. These can go either high or low. But the pins can also be configured as input to read any digital signal. This signal has high and lows. So at the pin side, we have to have some sort of high resistance to not affect the signal. This is in the mega ohm range. Because of this high resistance, almost no current is flowing. And simplified, we can consider it as disconnected pin. This is our third state. We will call it Z. And since we have now three states, this is called tri-state. But how can we utilize this to drive LEDs? If we assign Z to both ends, the LED is simply disconnected. Z and L, it's disconnected on the left side. L and Z is disconnected on the right side. And high and Z is also disconnected on the right side. So in none of these states, current is flowing. You might be wondering, oh well, uh, now we have a second off state or what? How does that help? That actually is useful when we are using Charlieplexing. So consider this 3 by 3 matrix. Viewed as a table, we have all combinations of two pins that can be connected to the left side and the right side. Since having the A pin on both sides doesn't make a lot of sense, because it's always the same level, we cannot use any LED on the diagonal of this matrix. To control all the LEDs of this matrix, we have to drive it column by column. Starting with A, we set A to high, and setting B and C to low, both LEDs will light up. B and C is on the right side here. Assigning high and high, both stay off. Assigning high and low, only the second one will light up. But now we are running into a problem here. Assigning B to high will also activate the second column. And now also the LED between B and C will light up. But we want to control it independently. 
And this is where our third state comes into play. Instead of I, we can simply disconnect it. Looking at the rest of the matrix, column B is completely disconnected. In column C, C to A, the current is reversed and blocked. And C to B is also disconnected. So that works out. Back to all the combinations in column A. Lighting up only A, B, we have to assign B to low and C to Z. With both low, both LEDs will light up. And with both Z, both LEDs will stay off. And that has to be repeated sequentially with setting B high, then C high, and starting all over again. Okay, so how it will develop if we add another pin? That actually doubles the LED count in this matrix. The total count of LEDs that we can control with n pins in Charlie Plexing is n squared. And since we are missing the LEDs in the diagonal, minus n. Compared to a regular matrix, we would be able to control the diagonal as well. But that would require another four pins to select the row and columns. And the total of LEDs that we can control with n pins is n half squared. Comparing the progression, although controlling the tri-state buffers might be more complicated, the count of LEDs for Charlieplexing is really growing fast. But you have also to consider that there is a current limit on the pin that's set to high. All the LEDs in this row or column are sharing the current from one high pin. You might also ask how to solve the missing diagonal in the matrix. That's quite simple. You just shift one of the triangles up a row. And that's all the magic that happens in the Megaplex as well. Since updating one line or column of this display only takes a few register writes, we are able to update the whole screen 23,000 times per second and still have some processing power left. This example here uses 8-bit gray values and it's still able to update 90 times per second. In this 1-bit mode, we are able to do up to 23,000 frames per second. I also started to implement a jump and run game on stream. If you didn't know, I'm streaming on YouTube and Twitch. Unfortunately, the buttons are messed up here. So we need another revision of this board. But let's take a look at the circuit. So this is the schematic. There is not much going on except for the huge Charlie Plexing matrix here. Down in the corner, this is the microcontroller. Then we have the voltage regulator. And this is just the USB port here. But let's take a look at the buttons. So I used the resistor ladder for the buttons, uh, thinking I would have like uh, this button at the least significant bit and this at the highest significant bit if I use an analog uh, read for this pin here and read all the buttons at once. However, what I didn't consider is that if the button is not pressed, it's just an open circuit here. So what happens is that the voltage jumps around um, depending on which buttons are pressed at the same time. And with all the noise from the display and so on, it's quite hard to get a proper reading for each individual button here. That needs to be changed for the next revision. This is the audio circuit. It's only the buzzer and since the buzzer is magnetic, it has some inductivity. And we want to protect our circuit with this flyback diode here, since I'm not using a MOSFET to drive it or anything. There is a resistor in series to limit the current to the speaker. Otherwise, our device might brown out if we're running it from a CR 2032. A little attention to detail is that I have two different footprints for battery holders on the back, and even a connector if you want to use a LiPo battery. But I will show that in a minute. As you can see, this is just a scaled up version of the example that we did before. We have 16 pins here and we have an LED between each of two pins except for C0 and C0 and so on. That's why we don't have any LED on the diagonal here. And I basically shifted the LEDs up, but let's take a look. Yeah, it's quite busy with all the LEDs here. And you can see the courtyards are almost touching here. This is only a two-layered board, so I can produce it really cheap. 
You have probably noticed that there are no current limiting resistors for the LEDs. That's because I searched a long time on LCSC to find LEDs that are going up to 3.2 volts. And actually all the parts from this board are from LCSC because JLCPCB did the assembly of the boards. And there are also today's sponsor which is quite convenient because I was assembling this device there anyways. So let's take a look how I get there my cheapest prototypes assembled. On the ordering page you just upload your Gerber files and select uh, whatever color you like. I pick black here and also lead free solder. Then you can just enable assembly here. The economic assembly is the fastest one. On the next page you just upload your bomb file and your positions file. Then you can match your components from the bomb with their library. We even get a preview of the components on the board. And as you can see I have to fix my orientation of the switch and of the USB. That is quite easy with the mouse and the keyboard. And when you are ready you get an overview of the cost. 50 bucks is quite reasonable for a prototype run here. As you can see the majority of the cost is due to extended components fee. That's just the setup fee for all the different components that are not basic components in their library. So this stays fixed if you order more boards and each board gets way cheaper. As you can see I did quite a few production runs with them already. What I really like about their service is the parts manager. You can basically keep an inventory of your components uh, at their side. So I have all the standard switches, USB ports and buzzers here, but also the infamous LEDs. So let's take a look. So this is the voltage range here and 3.2 volts is max. What's convenient about it is that you can basically secure a stock for your production run in future and are not affected by any part shortage anymore. If you are interested in their service, please check them out and try my coupon code from the description. They are also offering flex PCBs now and even CNC machining and 3D printing. So check it out. The assembly is instantly fast. You can get your boards shipped within two weeks. And I was really stunned when I hold them the first time in my hands. Oh, what? This is so awesome. And the matrix display. Oh, wow. Bitloonies Mega Plex. Here we go. <laughs> As mentioned I'm supporting two different footprints for battery holder on the back. And that's just another design consideration. So these are the two different battery holders that I support. As you can see, yeah, the plastic one is a lot higher than the flat metal one. But the disadvantage of the metal one is that you can uh, short this positive side here with the USB, with your keys or whatever. So that's only recommended if you have a case around it. And that one is less prone to any short circuits. So that's cool. Yeah, and this is a programming pin here. The device not only supports uh, regular CR2032, but also lithium version of that, which is rechargeable. So let's plug it in. Yeah, it's a little bit dimmer than from USB. But still alright. In the first revision I even had a charging circuit on, but that was charging really slow and I didn't want to fix everything at once and removed it for the second revision. So what do I want to change for the next revision? This version already supports USB. It's a soft implementation by Charles Lohr. That didn't exist one year ago. But I already knew someone would do it because the microcontroller is fast enough for that. How this is working right now is that I have this switch that switches the last remaining pins that are used for the buttons and sound to D plus and D minus of the USB. That works alright, but it's a mess and I want more pins for the buttons. So this slightly bigger microcontroller here has native USB and would still fit on this board. The extra pins might also come handy to solve my problems with the buttons. I will probably design the next revision of uh, this mini console on stream if you are interested. Also please subscribe to this channel if you like those quirky little projects. I have a few more that 
are unfinished but still presentable. Thanks to all my supporters for being so patient with me and thank you to JLCPCB for sponsoring my channel. I see you next time. Bye.